Thanks for staying with us. So our first guest today is Dr. Hafsat Abiola Costello, the Director General, Yahaya Bilo Presidential Campaign Council. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. So, you know, you've been trending for a while, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why you trended was obviously because um, you had granted an interview where you compared your dad mm -hmm. to your principal, which is um, Yahaya Bilo running for office. And obviously, a few people felt, ah, of all people in the world, mm -hmm. why is it Hafsat? Abiola Costello, that will be the director general, not just for him, but for, for Yahaya Belu. And your sister also had something to say about that on her own show. What was your response since that happened? And what, what, what cause have you gotten? Or what's your view on, on that perspective? I think that the good news is that um, so many people feel very passionately about my father. And that um, makes me feel deeply honored. And I know you'd be happy to see the love and concern and desire to protect his um, legacy and his memory. Um, I think one thing we can safely say is that um, everyone wants to respect and honor MK Abiola. And um, it's important that if my sister feels that I wasn't doing that, she should have the opportunity to say what she thinks. I feel strongly and I want to be on record um, as saying that if people were to know the candidate that I represent, they would even do and say more than I have done and said. Um, he's been a subject of a lot of fake news and so if it depends on when you stopped listening to the news about Kogi State. And um, so if people were just basing their opinion on his first term when he was completely bombarded by the interest groups that didn't have a chance to take over the state and they kept trying to cast him as incompetent, unprepared, all of those things, then it would be very hard to believe that I would compare him to MK Abiola. But my um, assessment is not based on news. I've, I go, I've gone to Kogi State, I've seen what he has done, I've done my own investigations. This is a man in whom I repose a great deal of confidence. I believe that this is the kind of leader Nigeria needs to transform our situation. And I believe that based on all I have seen of him, yes, he's not the, at the level that, of business that MKO um, achieved at, um, as he grew older, but he was, he's also much younger. Um, and we don't know what the future um, holds for him. Yeah. He, Okay, so when he became governor of Kogi State, this was in January 2016, the workers were on strike in that state. They had been on strike for a few months. <clears throat> and the state was actually known to be the um, worst in terms of security in the north central zone. The state today is one of the most secure in the whole country. The labor problems that he encountered, he resolved within the first two years. Um, is an accountant, so that wasn't in, uh, a, dif a difficult task for him. He has been able to unify the state. This is a state that has three major ethnic groups, but um, indigenous to that state, but many beyond, because it's a state that is bordered by another nine states um, from north and south. And he is on the, in his government, uh, represented all three ethnic groups of, that are indigenous, but also people from all six geopolitical zones signaling the intention to build a government of unity within a state. And then if you look at what he has done for women, it is really quite remarkable. At the local government level, all vice chairmen of local governments are women. The heads of service that have served him, he has been served by three to date, has been, have been women. His SSG at the moment is a woman. He, um, the ADC, people were laughing when he had an ADC that was a woman because it was unprecedented mm. for a governor to have a woman be ADC. She has, she has clearly demonstrated, demonstrated her right. ability to serve in that role. Mm. He has given women unprecedented opportunities, opportunities and they've met there and they've been able to make them, to be able to serve him in the roles he put them in. Now, for his own ambition, which is probably the most important thing to him, his ambition to be president of Nigeria. Oh, we'll he, appointed, we'll come back, yeah. he appointed a woman to be the director general. And we have also on our team, the director for media, which is normally a preserve of men, he appointed a woman. This is somebody that affirms 
women and it opens the spaces for women and it, then it also opens the spaces for young people. Mm -hmm. If you take the demographics of young people and women, its cabinet is 95% women and youth. All right. Okay. Um, so you said you did your own personal research because, yes, you know, for most of us, we don't know him personally, but we know what the residents of the states are saying and, you know, that ends up in the papers. So there have been stories about payment of pensions for yes. retirees. Um, we would like to hear what your investigations have found out concerning that. We would like to also know about the fact that, um, you know, he had an EFCC issue concerning the 20 billion bailout. And some people have said being the first person to have paid 100 million for the ticket, how has he been able to, where did he raise that money from? Where did he get that sort of money from? And hoping that has nothing, that is not money that's been taken out of the states to do that. So let's begin with the first issue of pensions and salaries. When he came into office, um, the first thing he did was an audit of um, personnel of the local government, um, of the state government. Not, it's not unique to Kogi State. Many states have ghost workers. And he was able to use this um, digital verif verification exercise to determine who are the real workers of Kogi State and who are the ghost workers. Um, by that, he was able to rationalize the civil service. And from that moment, when he completed that exercise, he has met the obligations of the state for salaries and for pensions. Um, at the local government level, he has not been able to, but he's not primarily the one responsible at local government level because um, the money that goes to the local government from, the, from Abuja, from the national government, goes directly to the local government. But if they were to base their salaries just on what they receive from the federation account, it would not be sufficient to meet the demands of local government salaries. But His Excellency decided that he would not um, retrench workers. You know, certain states have done that. One state in particular was able to retrench 21,000 workers. But in this state, he decided that they would not do that because he felt that it was important to send a message of solidarity. And to do that, instead, he decided that from the state coffers, they would send money to local government. Then the local government council, sitting with the labor unions of the local government, and sitting with um, other constituents in the state will determine how much will be paid to the local government workers. And mm -hmm. they've been doing that um, for the last few years. Okay. You find that a lot of the people that complained about salaries, especially at that local government level, are taking money from cooperatives. And when, they, when it's time to pay the cooperative back, they will close their account in the bank with which they had made the arrangement with their cooperative, open a new account, mm. and, and then go to a new cooperative, go and enter into a new loan. But when he came on board, he had to rationalize all of that. So he, um, he combined their debts. They agreed a sum to be paid back to the cooperative from their salaries, and it's taken from source. Okay. So when they'll, people will now send pictures, this is how much we received, but not say that actually it's because we've been in debt and we're repaying our debt. So the question I would ask my sister is, should the debts not be repaid? Should be. Let me go on a quick break. When we come back, we dig further on this conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. We're still discussing with Dr. Hapsad Abiola Costello. Yes, you're going to have um, actually the other oh. question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you also asked about the 20 billion money that was received and the EFCC investigation, I'd invite you to check with the EFCC directly and you'll find that they've closed this investigation because the state paid the money as was agreed with the World Bank. It was mainly for salaries and to all the people that the monies were paid to, the account numbers, the names, all of it was properly documented. I think Mike Okezie, who is director of research on the Campaign Council came and he answered all these questions. So I really invite that if you do not um, take our word, invite, um, yes. the, e invite the objective uh, participants and let them tell you. Okay, mm. okay. so um, just before the governor of Kogi State declared for his presidential ambition, the PDP had come out to say yes, he was going to declare, and then they had said that you know the state was um, had lean resources and was very indebted. So how truly indebted, what are the debt indices of the state? Because we know, yes, 
Nigeria is a very loan, you know, deficit. We're always borrowing to make up deficit. And we know state governors also owe. Also, this rumor, because in every rumor there's an element of truth. This rumor, continuous rumor of, you know, Kogi states being highly indebted, owing salaries, and having lean resources. And is the presidential ambition of the governor very well funded, personally, from his personal funds? So how is it funded? First, the governor is an accountant. And he actually is already um, one of the Gulf states in Nigeria, one of the few states in Nigeria that the World Bank has certified is transparent in its management of its finances. I don't know that um, there's, I don't know any other state that has the ranking that the World Bank has given His Excellency. Um, so we can safely say that if these kinds of um, international agencies have evaluated him, evaluated the work of the state in the management of resources and not found it to be lacking, there's a lot of, it, it, it means that there's really no credibility to the idea that is mismanaging the state. Now, this is also someone that doesn't like to take loans. He has been carefully managing the resources of the state. He has built the IGR of the state. When he came on board, it was 350. He found that the IGR was 350 million. He has built it to well, almost 2 billion before the pandemic hit. And um, if you even see his intention, his, his own intention is to build the capacity of the state to grow wealth. So when I was visiting the state, one of the things I saw, one of his achievements that his team wanted to, me to note was the um, internal revenue um, um, service building, which when they came on board was one apartment with two rooms. But now it's a massive edifice. This is someone that believes in the state's ability to generate its own <clears throat> economy and then tax the wealth that is there for, thereby generated. Mm -hmm. is not keen to take loans unduly. Right. All right, mm -hmm. let, me, let me come, I mean, you said quite a bit about your, about um, Yahya Bill. Yes. But I think, how do you respond to people who say that um, there's a, there's, the Nigeria has a moral obligation yes. to ensure presidency goes to the southeast? Mm. And there's um, something called the religious and ethnical equity that we must demonstrate as a nation. Because mm. um, we've had a Muslim and we'd say we want a Christian, or we want someone from the Southeast, because that's how we can have an equitable government where everybody feels like they're part of this system. How do you respond to that? Because many people feel that Yahya Bilo, first of all, shouldn't be there, not because he's not qualified, as you have said, yes. but if you think about moral obligation at this point, he's the least qualified for Nigerians. I mean, least appropriate, that's the right word, not qualified mm. at the time because of what, we, what I talked about earlier. Zoning. Well, there's only an issue. Moraya, you know, I'm sorry to be personal, but um, I still remember your mom of blessed memory when she walked with my mom in the demonstrations for June 12. I don't know if your mom ever told you the story. She said my mom would say to her, Amalo, we're going to do this march. And my, your mother would be wondering that, what madness, how can we do this march? And that wouldn't they get shot? Mm -hmm. And she would be so nervous. And she would get into that demonstration because she and my mom would be in the lead. And she would just keep saying to herself, Kudi said we will do it, that nothing will happen. Did she ever tell you this? She told me this. Kudi, Kudi said we should do it, nothing will happen. The truth is that the people that are truly marginalized in Nigeria are the women and the young people. And if there's any moral obligation, it is to them that it is owed. Hmm. And in the most egregious manner, we've seen much older people come into office from that demonstration, not just the, that particular march that your mom was describing to me, but the many marches. Who led the fight against June 12? Hmm. The fight against the annulment? Was it not the students? Yes. Was it not the young people? How many of them were shot? Hmm. How many? How many? I still remember one young man that became crippled. He was at OAU, and he became crippled on account of this fight. Where were they after the whole, in, in 1999, where were they placed? Can we say nowhere? Mm. Can we say nowhere? And mm. I challenge anyone. Now, you were talking, as I was waiting to come up, you were talking about the kidnappings, um, the bribe, um, the crime. When I look at all these events, it's clear to me 
that this is a revolt of young people in Nigeria. They've had enough. And many of them are revolting in ways that we don't understand and that we don't condone nor endorse. But they revolt nonetheless because they've had enough of being marginalized in their own country. If the country will not use them for good, they will use themselves for bad. And there's no candidate better positioned to harness and to signal to young people in Nigeria than my candidate that Nigeria is for them, that they are the ones that should be in charge. And even from everything we know in pre-colonial Africa, it's the young people that we ask them to lead, the elders counsel. And we're ready to lead. Young people and women in Nigeria are ready. We're taking no more excuses. We don't want any more excuses. Mm. But the major problem Nigerians have is, you know, politicians coming into government, coming, vying for offices and using Nigerians' wealth to aspire for office. Where, where exactly would the funding for the presidential campaign and ambition of the governor of Kogi State come from? The challenge that um, Governor Yaya Bello has is one and one alone, and that is to, um, to get the primary ticket. Mm -hmm. When he has done that, the young people of Nigeria, there will be no... The movement that, will, that they will lift up on behalf of this candidate will be unprecedented in mm -hmm. the history of this country. I am fully confident that the young people alone will carry this man to Asso Rock come 2023. Are you saying that would, you know, the Nigerians would fund it? How? They will fund it with the... 100 million first. The 100 million is... The, the governor himself was a, is a businessman before he even became governor. He has the money, and even he has people around him who believe in him. One of the things that you will really appreciate, and I look forward to you experiencing when you get to know this candidate, the basis of, um, of my own confidence in him is, not, is that he's not just by himself. The quality of his team, I've been spending a lot of time with them. I don't know if you noticed that my voice is a little hoarse, because there was also Ramadan, but also... Um, we've been up to 3 a.m. in meetings, working with the candidate, discussing with the candidate. He's never by himself. He has a team of highly professional, qualified, in their 40s people, some in their 30s. And the quality of those people, Mariah, is incredible. But not just their quality, the energy they have. There's an, they're centered, they're anchored, they're not, they're, they're not um, saying stupid things. They have, they're very practical, but all of them are successful in their own right. You have people in real estate, you have people in all kinds of domains of our society. Are you telling me that between them they won't put together the money for this candidate? Even when he was governor, before he showed this kind of promise, and when he was going to become governor, keep in mind that his, his um, ethnic group that he is from in that state is a minority group. People mobilized money for him then. Will they not do it now when it, he has even a better claim? Okay, talking, talking about practicality and being realistic, people would say the party on which he's running, um, they're, you know, the caliber of people on that same, in that same party running for, the, um, you know, vying for the same ticket. Are you being realistic and practical if you think he's going to take that ticket, um, you know, given the other people on the same, in the same party? When destiny aligns, Nothing will stop our candidates. 30 years after the incredible and tragic events of June 12, we have a candidate who has stepped forward and said that on Hope 1993 will build the foundation of his campaign, that this hope that was truncated, it will restore, who has shown that he's a unifier, who has shown that he's an effective manager of resources, who has shown that he is very keen to work on security, not because is, like you and me, deeply concerned. But no, because he has already done it in Kogi State. And I can tell you how he has done it in Kogi State. Is you, they get this thing called security vote. And I don't know where it all goes all over Nigeria. Let me tell you where it goes in Kogi State. It goes to these vigilante groups, local vigilante groups, um, hunters. Yes. When I was going into the state, even just for Salah, because I went to um, mark my Salah there, there will be checkpoints that were manned by these hunters. These hunters know the entire environment. Mm. They control and patrol that, those, those environments. Whenever they notice any movement that is suspicious, they raise an alarm, they move in. 
Even the police were telling me that sometimes they could be manning a certain um, um, length of road, and then they get a call that says withdraw, and they have to withdraw because it has come from above. Nobody is instructing these people because the only instructions are coming right. from the state, and the right. state has said man this road. All right, mm. I have to go on a break because, but I wanted you to touch a bit on the fact that your brother has yeah. also shown intention to be president. Yes. Um, have you had a conversation with him that you're going left, he's going right? Like, you're not supporting him? Was he really, I think he joined the party. What I read was that he, he said he, was, he had joined the party. He didn't say he wanted to be president. Flag be well, he said he has declared intention to run for the office of the president. I, did, I, I think he did. No, no, that. sweetheart. He said exactly what he's, he's doing his um, consultations. Okay. okay. Mm. So yes. if he does become, so um, what? Yeah. If he does indeed <laughs> pick a candidate, um, declares intention to actually run or actually pick a ticket from the state, from his party, what would you do? I'm director general. Let me repeat. I'm the first female director general of the presidential can campaign of a leading candidate. I will resume office and continue my job. And I will look to deliver a win for my candidate. Okay. Hey, all right, then we're going to break. <laughs> Come mm -hmm. back, we'll wrap up this conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So we're going to be going to social media to pick a few questions. But before we, before we while, while the ladies are picking out a question, one of my greatest fears, mm. if, um, if anybody but the southeastern president becomes president, including your own um, principal, is the fact that it might spur, off, spur up more of um, re re um, resistance from the southeast. So it's not going to be an easy governance because they're obviously going to be upset mm that they didn't get that chance. So I, I'm so fearful. If a non-Southeasterner becomes president, how would they have a, how would they be able to govern this country without that region getting more restive, getting more, um, um, resisting more to the government? And that, that, what plans does your own, does, your, does, does Yahya Bello have to ensure that he's able to carry everybody along, even though they might be unha unhappy, how would he carry the entire country along in, in this new government if he becomes president? He's already shown that he's highly skilled at unifying people. He's done this in Kogi State, where there were three highly polarized ethnic groups, that he had he forged unity um, among them with his careful appointments to make sure that everyone felt included and well represented. He would do the same as president of Nigeria. Okay. He also, you know, um, yes, just about two days ago yeah. in Imo State in Orere, um, Ralph Owazurike led a march for the movement, um, Masob, I think movement for the sovereign um, state of Piafra. He led a movement to say that his candidate was Governor Yaya Bello. So even in the East, we've seen that Masob is endorsing him, but it's not just Masob. The women of the Southeast ha had a march a few weeks ago endorsing him. He has support in the Southeast. He has support in the southwest. He has support in the south south. He has support all there? over Nigeria. If he has support, can and he we go are going. There? We are going there. We, mm -hmm. um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that from next week, His Excellency will begin a series of zonal visits that will be nationwide. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a few. Anyone? What was the honourable says? Please let your tell your guests. Or let your guests be reminded that in almost eight years of Governor Bello of Kogi, he didn't create job, no key development in the state. How can he lead Nigeria on this precarious state? We need a tried and tested man who understands Nigeria. Why keep this? I wanted to build on this question. question when you talked about the IGR. You know, Kogi for me is a very well civil, um, is a civil servant state. Okay. When you talk about uh, people paying salaries and all of that. And you know that being a civil servant state doesn't mean you're self-sustainable. You're always going to be taken from the federal to pay the state if, you're, if you don't have private jobs and companies growing. How many private investors were they able to bring in? Significantly, His Excellency is pro-business in the state. You know Confluence Rice mm -hmm. and other investments that he has been making in the rice value chain. He understands that one of the big assets of the state is agriculture, but he doesn't want us to just be restricted to farming, but to look also at the value addition in farming. So significant resources in the state have been directed in that regard. There's also the investment agency of the state to help potential investors to
go through all the processes so that everything is made easy for them. The truth about economics is that, I'm sorry, the truth about economics is that a lot depends also on federal. You know, the, the national framework also helps the states to be, to be able to know which way to go and seize opportunities. And Kogi State has um, indicated to the, to the federal government their desire for the restoration and completion of Ajakuta Steel Mill. Ajakuta Steel Mill, if completed, would generate 50,000 jobs and would be so instrumental for Nigeria. But it's not something that Kogi State alone can do. That is not consoling for me because when you talk about Ajakuta, it's almost like, mm. don't even, let's no, just forget about yes, it. Yeah. I would love to hear, you know, that more companies, where, you know, foreign investors have been able to come into Kogi and created the investment around Kogi. Kogi is a state where if you have a quarry, you have, you know, cement production and several other, it's a very rich Yes. In resources yes. Yes. So I would love to hear that, you know, this and this and yeah. this is because of all these companies that have come in, the IGR then was able to grow. It, it, it's exactly that, that he has been able to build, he set up an invest business, a business council made up of some of the most successful businessmen in Nigeria, not just in Kogi State, but they're, they're from Kogi State. And those people have been guiding the government on policies and um, practices that would encourage business investment. And it has been working. It's why the state's IGR grew to almost two billion before the pandemic, and it's now yeah, and, well and over a billion. Someone is asking, how long have you known him? Because you are defending him like you've known him. How long mm -hmm. have, have you known him? And how long have you investigated him for? Like you're defending him so righteously. Yes, I've known him for a little over a year. The first time that he came into my awareness was through my baby brother. Um, Abdul Mumuni, who is my baby brother, but he's in his 30s. Abdul Mumuni went to see him and came to me and said that this candidate, this person is very um, important and very special. But at the time when Abdul Mumuni said that, I was turned off because I'd been groomed on a steady diet of poisonous information about this candidate. So because I, um, I, I mean, I raised Abdul, Abdul Mumuni from when he was nine years old, when my mom died. Um, so, you know, I know that Abdul Mumini knows what I would respect. So I thought to look deeper. And from that moment, I started conducting my investigations. I have to wrap up with you right now. Um, if this doesn't work, what's next for you? What's your plan B? If he doesn't get the ticket, what happens? He will get the ticket. There's always a plan B now, the other side of the coin. Just in case it doesn't, what happens? There is no need for a plan B. This is a moment that God is directing and we will get to the finish line and we will have the ticket. Okay. And Nigeria will have its chance to really say farewell to poverty. Mm. All righty. Yeah. 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 I, I have comments. to run. Online, yeah. You have a very tough job because I, we get yes, we, yeah. time. I would love yeah. to read some of the comments for you. That's all we can take on the show at this time. Thank you very much. We'll be speaking with <laughs> Yahya Belos. Um, DJ. Director General of his um, campaign team. Thank you so much, Dr. Hafsat Abiola Costello, for joining us this morning. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you for listening. Let's go on a quick break. When we come back, we're bringing our next guest. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back.